Thank you. The next item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion 15279 in the name of Fergus Ewing on future rural policy and support in Scotland. I would encourage all members who wish to contribute in this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Fergus Ewing, to speak to and to move the motion. Uh, presenting officer, we are 78 days from Brexit and yet we still don't know what sort of Brexit we face. What is clear is that none of the Brexit options are good for Scotland's rural economy. All are problematic for sectors like farming, food and drink, agriculture, forestry and fisheries. And this government maintains that the best outcome for Scotland is what we voted for, to remain in the EU. The least bad option is membership of the single market and the customs union. But a no deal option. All right. Peter Chapman. Does the Cabinet Secretary not accept that this was a UK wide vote and the UK decided to come out of the EU? Cabinet Secretary. Well, you see, one of the differences, and I'm pleased about this actually, between my party and his party is that we believe that the people of Scotland have the right to determine their future. Uh, and I believe other parties subscribe to that principle as well. And it is astounding to me that the Conservatives prefer to ignore the views as expressed by the population of Scotland in that vote, a clear no, a clear remain, and clearly opposed to Brexit. And we respect that mandate, and we, have, uh, we are doing our best to deliver it. Presenting officer, a no, deal, a no deal would be catastrophic for rural Scotland and simply must be taken off the table. When we first debated Brexit's impact on rural Scotland in September 2016, I was clear that Scotland needed to get on with deciding her own future, and that is what we have done. We have worked to gather views and recommendations to inform policy and support, and I thank everyone who participated in that work, principally the agricultural champions and the members of the NCRA. We have listened carefully to what our stakeholders have recommended should change, and we continue to do so. We have consulted on a plan to transition from CAP that sets out the most detailed proposals that exist in the UK. And I'm pleased, very pleased, that most respondents uh, to our proposals uh, in the Stability and Simplicity paper uh, broadly support these proposals, which take us forward uh, not until 2022, as some of the Conservative government's proposals do, but into 2024, five years ahead, and I'm determined to continue to take these forward. Our plan sets out for the first two years as much stability as we can provide. Beyond 2021, we will maintain the current landscape of schemes, but with changes to simplify them. And we will also seek to free up resources to pilot new approaches we want to implement beyond 2024. We've created an internal simplification task force and also appointed a panel of individuals and sector representatives to guide the task force work and priorities. In particular, Members of that panel have real live experience of how CAP schemes have operated and a significant stake in rural Scotland's future. Already, opportunities have been identified to streamline current schemes. Presenting officer, I can announce that the task force will in addition be asked to review the process for forestry grant applications to determine where we can make improvements. And I've also asked for a review of the whole forestry grant scheme so that even more small landowners can access support to plant trees and create woodland. Well, Certainly. Tavish Scott. I'm not going to ask uh, Cabinet Secretary about forests, but uh, what I was going to ask about in the context of the uh, task force was the appeals mechanism for crofters and farmers who've uh, fallen foul of that in the past. Will that be part of the task force's regime, uh, uh, considerations? Yes, it will. And, and uh, I think Mr. Scott raises uh, a point that actually is one that's raised by many members across the political spectrum, that many farmers and crofters, uh, including in Shetland, uh, are very concerned about the over-prescriptive nature of the CAP scheme, the very, very limited and restricted margin, permitted margin for error, the way in which alleged or actual infringements of the scheme are treated, the disproportionate nature of the penalties, which often seem to be far more uh, swinging than anyone feels is fair or reasonable. I think there's common ground on that. Uh, and this actually is at the root of many of the farmers and crofters' discontent about the CAP rather than the EU itself. 
which in financial terms has been a good friend, particularly to the Highlands and Islands, uh, part of which Mr. Scott represents. Um, so uh, we, we believe this is very important work, uh, but creating bespoke policy for farming and food production requires very careful consideration. It's very complex. It's right that we give it that careful consideration. I was therefore happy, presiding officer, to include the proposal from Mr. Rumbles and the Scottish Liberal Democrats in our motion that we convene a group consisting of producer, consumer and environmental organisations to inform the development of future... Well, you know, I think Mr. Rumbles thinks it's right to involve the people of Scotland in the work that we do, not impose top-down policies from these benches. We think it's right to involve stakeholders in policy making, not exclude them. The written part of my speech says, I hope all parties will support this action. How naive am I, presiding officer? Anyway, the motion also sets out key principles for future policy, sustainability, simplicity, Innovation, inclusion, productivity and profitability are core objectives. They're designed as a starting point rather than an exhaustive list. But I want to focus on the last, profitability, because we need to create policy and support for Scotland's rural economy which allows it to succeed. And one key driver and measure of success should surely be that rural businesses and sectors are profitable, that they create wealth for their owners, and perhaps more important, they provide fair work beyond their own families where possible, create opportunities for wider supply chains and help the communities in which they are based to flourish. Uh, creating greater profitability in the sector will in part depend on future support. Now on funding, I've been clear that this government sees a continuing role for direct support, particularly for farming and food production. Our definition of public goods must encompass, presiding officer, the multiple roles performed by farmers and crofters, uh, food production and stewardship of the countryside and natural assets. But policy needs to turn funding, uh, needs funding to turn good intentions into success. And we believe the UK government is at risk of having over-promised and under-deliver in this regard. Those in favour of Brexit, including Michael Gove and George Eustace, with whom I have good workman -like relations, and I will see them in London on Monday, they have led us to believe that there might be more funding available post-Brexit for rural industries if we voted to leave. That's what they said. They said that during the Brexit referendum. So they gave those guarantees. But whilst these guarantees received have been welcome, we are some way off delivery of them. So... I hope the review of convergence funding, which is now at long last underway, will deliver the fair outcomes that Scotland's farmers are due. And I remain hopeful that the UK government will accept amendments to its agriculture bill, which provide a funding guarantee for the future. But ongoing on uncertainty on funding, presiding officer, is creating specific and very real-time issues. Now, I want to turn to Elfas. We should not forget that Scotland is the only part of the UK providing this additional support to our most marginalised farmers, especially in crofting on the hills and uplands. We continued this funding, Elfas, when England and Wales did not, because it is needed. That's why the situation we find ourselves in, transitioning out of Elfas without clarity on what we are transitioning to, is so difficult. So, I want to provide certainty where I can. Presiding officer, less favoured areas funding for 219 and 220 will not fall below 80% of LFAS. Uh, I and my officials will continue to work with stakeholders to find options to achieve that. And, as I previously committed, any additional funding arising from the convergence review, which is now underway by Lord Bew, will be prioritised for this purpose. If there are sufficient monies, we will effectively reinstate funding levels to 100% of LFAS. <coughs> Excuse me. I will also want to make absolutely clear that in the future, this government will continue to ensure that the most marginalised farmers and crofters receive additional financial support that acknowledges the difficulties under which they farm and steward our countryside. Of course, funding is not the only issue we're having to fight for. As the legislative consent memorandum laid before this parliament sets out, we've had to fight a rearguard action to keep Scotland's powers over farming uh, and food production. 
I've sought to resolve these issues in the Agriculture Bill constructively with Mr. Goh, and I've been heartened by his willingness at least to consider these matters. But on fundamental issues which he maintains are reserved, I and this government are certain that these issues are devolved. DEFRA has sadly not budged, uh, and we have run out of time. Some continue to suggest that the best way to legislate for future rural policy is through a schedule in the UK's Agriculture Bill. That would be inappropriate, not least because these substantive issues over powers in the UK Bill remain unresolved. But I contend, Presiding Officer, that it is this Parliament's job and role to develop, consider and pass the legislation that rural Scotland needs to underpin policy in the future. Indeed, I would suggest that this Parliament is best placed to legislate for Scotland's rural needs and interests, not least because our legislative process is more transparent and more thoughtful. It also ensures that stakeholders and communities are fully engaged. And I can testify this Parliament can and does hold government to account and seek to arrive at a co considered and compromised approach. So as well as seeking, if I have time, John Scott. I'll be brief. Uh, thank you for taking the intervention, Cabinet Secretary. Can you put a date on when that bill will be brought forward, a Scottish Agricultural Bill, please? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it, I can't give a date at the moment. The timetable is to be fixed, but it will be brought forward uh, in more than sufficient time for it being required. The purpose of the bill uh, is uh, primarily to provide the, the fundamental framework for continuance of payments to be made, but also to allow changes in future policy post-Brexit should that occur. Uh, so I, I will of course come back to the member and all members about the timetable in due course but the key point is that I can provide a 100% assurance that it will be brought forward in more than sufficient time for Parliament to debate it in full and for it to be receiving consent and approval in time to do its job and uh, there's no jubility about that this is what we do this is what we are here for and this is what we will achieve uh, so in conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, I very much look forward to the debate and listening to what all members have to say. Uh, I know that in Scotland we are proud of what our farmers and crofters achieve and those working in the wider rural economy. They produce great food. They provide the environmental stewardship that creates the scenery and the landscape that we enjoy and so many people come to Scotland to visit they're at the heart of rural communities. It's impossible to imagine rural Scotland without farming continuing for generations and indeed centuries to come as it has played an essential part in the history of Scotland in generations and centuries past. It's my privilege to champion their interests and I will do everything within my power to continue to do so. And the motion that I move in my name marks, presiding officer, the start of that process. Thank you very much. And I now call uh, Donald Cameron to speak to and move the amendment in his name. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I refer to crofting and farming in my register of interest and also duly move the, the amendment uh, in my name? Uh, I welcome the opportunity to discuss our vision for future rural policy and support in this important debate. Both the challenges and also the possibilities for rural Scotland are significant particularly as we leave the European Union, and it is our determination that we do right by our rural communities in this regard. Um, I can't let the reference to uh, the Prime Minister's deal go unremarked upon. The fact is, there is the Prime Minister's deal or there is no deal on the table, and that is why the SNP oppose no deal. They should support the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister's deal has the support of the National Farmers Union of Scotland, but not the SNP, and I know whose word I would prefer to take. As a Highlands and Islands MSP, I recognise and understand the challenges that rural parts of Scotland face. From concerns over... Um, I will, yes. Um, I have with me Scottish uh, farming leader and uh, the Claire Slipper, the political affairs manager of the NFU, uh, says that they need access to the single market and to remain in the customs union. Does the Prime Minister's deal deliver that? Donald Cameron. The NFUS have been quite clear many times that they support the Prime Minister's deal as yeah. the best way of protecting Scotland's farmers. Yeah, yeah. 
From concerns over long-term funding and farm debt, fewer younger people looking to take on a career in farming, and ongoing battles that farmers face to get a fair price for their product from supermarkets, there are a lot of issues to tackle. But there are also reasons to be optimistic about the future and the opportunity to design a new and bespoke system of support for our farms and crofters is one of them. I'd like to address, presiding officer, some of the issues in our amendment. We refer to the UK Agricultural Bill, as did the Cabinet Secretary. We continue to believe that the interests of Scottish farmers would be best served by Scotland being part of this bill, just as Wales and Northern Ireland will be, to provide a framework for support payments to be made. We take succour from the fact that the clear preference of the NFUS is to have a Scottish schedule in the UK bill, as they say, in order to offer certainty and stability sooner rather than later. It is described as a belt and braces approach, and it is a matter of great regret that the SNP appear to be more concerned with putting nationalism ahead of the interests of Scotland's farmers by refusing to engage and by refusing to engage and take up the offer of a Scottish schedule in the bill, because such a schedule will not restrain our ability to create a bespoke Scottish system via later Scottish legislation. And in terms of the wider aspects of the UK bill, whilst I think many of the principles and ideas articulated by Michael Gove in relation to agriculture in England deserve consideration, such as the principle of public money for public goods, we on these benches are committed to a definitive Scottish support system which addresses the unique nature of farming here in Scotland. In relation to LFAS, our amendment also mentions the reduction of LFAS payments and the effects this will have on livestock farming. The fact of the matter is that only a few days ago, the Cabinet Secretary suggested that LFAS payments will drop to 40% of current levels over the next two years. He has today clarified his position in, I have to say, a screeching U-turn under intense pressure because cuts to LFAS, regardless of when they happen, yes. Wait a second. Uh, I've made clear countless times, including from where I stand, that I'm determined that LFAS should not go below 80%. The press release to which you refer simply alluded to the fact that the European Union, at the December Council meeting, which I attended, and where I made representations to Commissioner Hogan directly at a meeting, decided to lift their proposed reduction from 20 to 40 per cent. That's modest improvement, but it's not enough. That's crystal clear. I've always made that as clear as I have today. Yeah, yeah. Donald Cameron. Nevertheless, cuts to Elfast have a, will have a catastrophic impact on Scotland's hill farmers and crofters. And they have nothing to do whatever with Brexit, and to pretend otherwise is to play politics with farmers' livelihoods. Yeah, yeah. The NFUS have been clear about LFAS. They've said, uh, Andrew McCormick has said, LFAS payments provide a vital financial boost to those who are trying to forge a living out of some of the hardest land in the country. Much darker were the words of the chair of the Scottish Crofting Federation yesterday, Russell Smith, who said reducing LFAS support to 80% sends out a very negative message, but we can live it. But to then cut it to a mere 40% will be ruinous. Being told now that this, and this is what he says, I'm quoting, being told now that this vital support will be reduced to 40% next year is a slap in the face to us in the less favoured areas and indicates failure on the part of the Scottish Government. So looking forward, as he designs the new support system, I urge the Cabinet Secretary to ensure that those farming on the 85% or so of Scottish land classified as less favourable are properly supported. This moment in time provides him with the perfect opportunity to mitigate the effects of the damaging cuts which he is making to LFAS payments. In terms of future support, let me strike a more consensual approach. We agree with much of the Scottish Government's motion and we will pledge to work with the Cabinet Secretary and others across the Chamber and the many interested parties across Scotland to help devise a support system fit for Scotland's farmers. We agree that any future support must ensure that farmers are able to continue to deliver the high quality produce that makes up Scotland's natural larder. We agree that the new system must be simpler, must create stability and must reward active productive farming. We agree that profitability is central. We welcome the opportunity to include producer groups, consumer groups and environmental groups in assisting with the formulation of a bespoke system. But like many others, we are wary about the creation of yet another expert group. We've got task force, task force fatigue. Over the last two and a half years, since the Brexit vote, 
We have had countless councils, committees, task forces, groups of advisers, reports, all well-intentioned. But yet another Scottish Government committee or grouping is the last thing we need, especially in the absence of any detailed policy from the government. I want to turn to some of the things that we on these benches has, have specifically proposed, which we feel will help our rural communities flourish. First and foremost, I want to pay tribute to our farmers and crofters, who are, after all, the custodians of our countryside. I know how hard they work, and I'm always conscious of the decisions that we as politicians make and what kind of impact they will have on our farming communities. And I've written to the Cabinet Secretary and stated that we believe that food production must be at the heart of future farming policy. Scottish food and drink is world-renowned, and the promotional efforts of both the UK Government and the Scottish Government should be commended, not least because we know that our food and drink sector is looking to double its worth from £15 billion annually to £30 billion by 2030. We think that can be achieved. But we, need, we believe that farmers should be incentivised to deliver the necessary raw produce required to make this ambition become real. Our farmers and crofters do exemplary work in looking after the natural environment. In Scottish Environment Link argue that food production is part of a fair, healthy and sustainable food system. I'm pleased to see, for instance, that we've got Scottish Rural Action, uh, led by Emma Cooper and Fiona Thompson, who've been here all week in a um, stand in the Scottish Parliament, promoted by my colleague Finlay Carson, which wants to promote the importance of engaging with Scotland's rural communities more widely. We also believe that for there to be a stable future in farming, we need to look at ways of encouraging the next generation of farmers to get involved. Organisations such as the Scottish Association of Young Farmers already carry out important work in encouraging new entrants. But we think that we need to make farming more flexible so that new farmers can pursue other income streams while also maintaining the farming side of their business, thereby making farming a more attractive prospect for new entrants. Above all, we need a system that allows farmers to improve their farms rather than punish them for non-compliance. So in conclusion, presiding officer, we want to see a proper support system in place tailored to Scotland, one which is easy to access and doesn't burden farmers with unnecessary bureaucracy. We want to see our food and drink sector grow. We want rural communities to reap the benefits of that growth. We are willing to work with the government to achieve these aims, but the SNP needs to come forward soon and present a clear and detailed policy proposal so that Scotland's farmers and crofters have clarity as to what the future holds for them. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Rhoda Grant to speak to and move the amendment in her name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our crofters and farmers have been looking for an indication of the direction of travel eh, for agricultural support post-Brexit for some time, and hopefully today will bring them some of the clarity they seek. The government motion, while there's little to disagree with, lacks ambition for our rural communities and takes little notice of the particular disadvantages that affect those on the periphery. This motion is about preserving the status quo rather than showing ambition for our farming and crofting communities. And I can understand that in turbulent times the status quo appears attractive. However, I believe we need to grasp this opportunity now more than ever, we need to grow these rural economies um, and, that, and agriculture remains a driver for that. The motion doesn't recognise the need for remote, more remote rural areas that have higher costs due to distance from market and suppliers to receive more funding. Neither does it mention the disadvantage of climate and poor soil quality that puts those in the industry in some parts of Scotland at a natural disadvantage. Elfast was designed to mitigate these disadvantages. However, when the EU proposed a new scheme to assist areas of natural constraint, the Scottish Government did not move from Elfast to an ANC scheme. And while we welcome the Cabinet Secretary assurances today, they must take some responsibility for the cuts of 80% in Elfast now being faced by our most marginal farming and crofting businesses. And they must learn from this. The status quo is not always best. Our current system is very biased towards large-scale production where some farmers who could run profitable businesses without support receive the lion's share of that support. The top five recipients of single farm payment in Scotland receive more than the bottom 3,500 recipients combined. And sadly, 45% of farms 
make an income equivalent to less than the minimum agricultural wage, with 23% making a loss. And yet, it is those businesses that are arguably offering more by way of public goods that receive least in the way of funding. Public money must be used prudently to address these issues. Therefore, a new scheme must recognise public benefits as well as food security. The scheme cannot operate in a silo. It has to fit with wider government policy, which is why we have been calling for a Good Food Nation Bill. We have fantastic produce that is world-renowned and yet many of our people are malnourished. Therefore, what we want from our farmers and crofter, crofters has to be the basis of the new scheme. While the key principles of sustainability, simplicity, innovation, inclusion, productivity and profitability are laudable, they don't take into account our right to food. So many of our children are growing up in poverty, storing up problems for future generations with their health service, and it also affects the life chances and the lifespan of those children. Farming and crofting are also economic drivers as well as food producers. And yet much of the profitability is lost to those communities by very long food chains, building in costs that eat into profits. Local procurement could cut costs to the public sector while supporting the local agriculture industry, allowing farmers and crofters to sell direct to large public bodies is, is a potential we have never fully recognised and we need to encourage cooperative working between individual businesses that would allow them to compete and ensure a supply of goods to those organisations. These enterprises will need support to get off the ground, but given cooperation lies at the heart of many of our agricultural communities already, with the use of things like machinery rings and indeed the management of common gracings. It's not an alien concept to them. However, current schemes, especially environmental schemes, work against this method of cooperation. We have to recognise that agriculture also played a part in keeping people in these communities providing work and economic benefits. So if we are to halt depopulation and turn it around, we must maximise the impact of the industry by keeping secondary processing within these communities too. We speak about diversification, but we should also couch that in terms of maximising the benefits that agriculture brings to rural communities. We agree with the Scottish Government motion where it calls for fair funding. This recognises that Scotland, with its large rural areas, provide a greater share of the UK's agriculture and should be funded accordingly. And the UK government appear to have accepted this argument, but we must work to ensure that it comes to fruition. Therefore, we cannot support the Conservative amendment today that removes this part of the government's motion. Our preference would also be for a Scottish agriculture bill um, to protect the devolved settlement, and we welcome the commitment to that today by the Cabinet Secretary. We must, however, we must also work to replace other EU funding that went to rural communities. For example, the LEADER programme initiated innovative working that helped underpin many of these communities. Turning to the Green Amendment, like ours, it highlights the needs for schemes to encourage good environment practice. Current schemes, as I mentioned, locked out, lock out cooperative working, but they also ignore steps towards um, carbon sequestration. This is a disincentive and we must use um, support to help offset emissions from the farming sector, emissions that will continue but can be offset by carbon sequestration. Presiding officer, we recognise the uncertain, that the uncertainty prevails and the impact that this has on the agriculture sec sector. We believe that we have an opportunity to build a policy and strategy that supports our farming communities going forward. Given the challenges the future hold, it is important to strengthen the sector and protect it now. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I now call Mark Ruskell to speak to and move the amendment in his name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, like other members, I welcome the opportunity to debate the future of rural policy and funding today. Uh, but it has been a long time coming, with only 78 days to go, allegedly, until we leave the EU. 
we are still behind other parts of the UK in deciding what will replace the current common agricultural policy. But I had hoped that this debate today we could find consensus and begin to move forward with this urgent process. Now, my amendment seeks to place the climate emergency at the heart of our rural support policy because the future of farming, perhaps more than any other sector, is in doubt if we fail to urgently take action. And of course, it's not just our domestic industry that, that's at stake, but our entire globalized food supply chain. Now, the NFUS said in this parliament recently that they did not believe that climate change was a top priority for the Scottish government. Their words, not mine. Now, we need to see that change and for a greater recognition that profitable farms are also low-carbon farms, which can maintain strong market advantage on quality and public goods delivery. Now, government ministers have previously said in this chamber that a net zero target for the farming sector is not possible because of the emissions inherent in our food production. But that really misses the point of net zero and the need for whole farm accounting. And I'd like to make it clear that with regards to achieving net zero emissions from agriculture, I'm talking about emissions on a whole farm level, with farmers being credited with the positive carbon sequestration effects of well-managed farmland, as well as the carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions caused by farming practices on the other side of the balance sheet. Now, current emissions accounting. Yes, I would. Stuart Stevens. Uh, just as a matter of clarification, is it now the Greens' policy that every single sector has to be zero carbon, uh, zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Because previously I had thought the Greens' policy was that Scotland had to be, which is quite a different thing. Mark Ruskell. Well, Mr Stevenson will know through our deliberations in the Environment Committee that every single sector needs to play a part. And farming and transport, agriculture and transport are two sectors that need to work very hard. He'll also be aware of the enormous carbon sequestration potential from land management in Scotland. And I'm sure we'll continue this discussion in the Environment Committee as we work on our climate change report. Now, current emissions accounting puts agriculture in one silo and land management in another, and it doesn't reflect the reality of whole farm systems. Farming and land management are perhaps the only sector where we can not only talk about reducing emissions, but also the carbon banking side of the balance sheet. And this needs to be at the ambitious heart of a national plan for achieving a net zero carbon economy. Now, until now, we've relied on voluntary methods, such as the Farming for Better Climate program, which is Good, but these have had limited uptake, and the reduction in emissions from the sector as a whole has stagnated in the last 10 years. Resourcing remains poor. I mean, the Climate Change Committee again heard that there's only one full-time equivalent in the Scottish Government dedicated to this huge agenda. And it's clear that voluntary measures are not going to deliver the transformation in farming that we need on their own. Farm assurance schemes, while worthy, will always be limited in ambition, if governed solely by their investing membership. So it's time that we use the most powerful non-punitive measures we have and directly link farm support to action on climate change and the delivery of other wider public goods. Now this means embedding the principle of a net zero target into our farm support scheme and financially rewarding farmers for actions, such as reducing reliance on industrial fertilizers while building soils as healthy carbon sinks through agroecological farming and agroforestry. Many of these approaches, as well as the work, essential work in climate change, of flood management can be rolled out on a catchment-wide scale. But this needs coordination between farms, as Rhoda Grant has already alluded to. And without this coordinated delivery work, we'll not see the scale of knowledge transfer and action that can actually make the difference on the ground. Now, a net zero target has the backing of civil society, with 50 organizations writing an open letter last year to the Scottish Government calling for a target for carbon neutral farming, including Community Land Scotland, the Organic Growers Alliance, Scottish Crofters Federation, and Scottish Land and Estates. And just last week, just um, if I've got time, I'll take Mr. Scott. Um, John Scott. Oh, well, thank you um, for taking the intervention. Uh, Mr. Ruskell, uh, notwithstanding what you say, would you accept that nonetheless it is the advice of the Climate Change Committee that uh, a net zero target is not achievable for the whole of Scotland and particularly not for agriculture as well? 
Mark Russell. Well, as Mr. Scott knows, there are complexities in the way that the inventory in relation to agriculture is actually assessed. And I'd welcome UKCC's advice on that. And of course, the government has requested advice. So let's see what they come back with in April. We may be in a very different place on this. But let me quote the National Farmers Union, uh, the, the President Minette Batters, who told the Oxford Farming Conference recently that, and I quote her, our aim must be ambitious to get our industry to net zero across all greenhouse gas inventories by 2040 or before. This isn't the Green Party, this is the National Farmers Union speaking. She recognizes that this will not only fulfill farming's duty to the environment, mm -hmm. but help build our reputation as, as a world leader in climate-friendly food production. Now, for those of us who see Scotland's place as firmly within the EU, of course, it can be hard to talk about opportunities that may come from Brexit. But seeking alignment with a common agricultural policy doesn't have to mean clinging to the status quo either. The cap is changing with plans well underway for reform post-2020. We can guarantee that climate change and the Paris Agreement will be at the heart of the new cap. The IPCC warned us last year we have only 12 years left to make the necessary changes to avoid catastrophic climate change. This may be our only chance to change the direction of rural policy and funding in Scotland. We have to prioritise sustainable management of our natural resources and our climate on which our entire farming system is based on because we are the first and the last generation of people on this earth who know both the scale of the climate emergency and how to fix it. We should act now or without any further delay and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I now call Mike Rumbles to open for the Liberal Democrats. I am very pleased to speak on behalf of the Liberal Democrats in support of the government's motion before us today. In a spirit of New Year cheer, I did put forward a positive addition to the Scottish Government's draft motion, which Fergus Ewing generously shared with me over the break. And as he said, he has incorporated my proposal into the Government's motion, and I appreciate that. It calls on the Scottish Government to convene a group consisting of producer, consumer, and environmental organisations to inform and recommend a new bespoke policy on farming and food production for Scotland. Now, I have long argued in this chamber and beyond that if we are to establish an effective bespoke policy for the rural economy that works, then we need to ensure that everyone involved has a buy-in to it, whatever is produced. We will only get a successful bespoke new policy if we do indeed manage to achieve buy-in from producers, consumers and environmentalists. If organisations representing these interests can get around the table can reach agreement which informs and recommends to the Scottish Government a positive way forward, then we have so much of a better chance of succeeding in developing the right bespoke system for Scotland. And I'm a bit lost that I don't understand how anyone could call this a status quo situation. I'm very pleased to see that Fergus Ewing is indeed willing to convene such a group. And I know that producer organisations such as NFU Scotland, consumer organisations and environmental groups such as Scottish Environmental Link will be more than happy to participate, then we will be well on the way to achieving success in developing our new policy. Now, I don't wish to be prescriptive, of course, as to which other producer, consumer, and environmental organizations should be involved, as I think it's only right that the minister himself needs to make that decision. I do think it's important to acknowledge that as political parties, we have our genuine differences. For instance, as a Liberal Democrat, I fervently wish that we were not in this position of leaving the European Union and therefore a need of designing our own system of rural support. However, we are where we are. It is essential that for future prosperity of our rural economy, we all make our best efforts to reach agreement across the Chamber on designing the best bespoke system of rural support that meets the unique needs of Scotland's rural economy. And this is where, if I may gently say to Donald Cam Cameron, the Conservative Amendment completely, in my view, misses the whole point here. Their amendment would remove the requirement for the Scottish Government to convene the group of producer, consumer and environmental organisations that do need to come up with recommendations for our new bespoke system. It would remove the requirement for any real buy-in from these organisations. Fergus Ewing, our Rural Economy Secretary has an enormously difficult job to do here, and I want to see him succeed in his task. I'm glad that the motion before us recognises the need to reach broad agreement from stakeholders, and I'm sorry to say, but if 
if we were to accept the Conservative amendment, we would make it more difficult. I would like to see us put party arguments and party advantage to one side here. And if we do, then I'm sure there'll be also a willingness for our producer, consumer, and environmental organizations to do the same. The great prize is a bespoke and successful system of rural support, which will enable our rural economy to thrive. In, in, uh, yes, I will. Mm -hmm. Julian Martin. Full to the member for Take Advantage. Is he hearing the same thing for, as I am from stakeholders that they are really asking us to put our party um, differences aside in talking about this? Mike Rumbles. I absolutely uh, concur. That's the message that I'm getting, and I hope everybody else is also receiving that too. In, in my reason, in my view, there's no reason why every party, every party in this chamber, can't back this motion before us tonight. There is obviously some discussion to be had about future frameworks for rural support across the UK. However, there should be no doubt that rural issues are devolved under the Scotland Act and that it is the Scottish Parliament that has the responsibility for legislating here. The fact that it is our responsibility to legislate for Scotland's rural economy is clear. However, this puts an even greater responsibility on our rural economy secretary and equally on the UK ministers responsible for England, Wales and Northern Ireland to use their best efforts, their best efforts to reach agreement on how any future common framework would actually operate. Having a bespoke policy on farming and food production in Scotland legislated for us in this parliament and having an agreed UK wide common framework for rural support is not mutually exclusive. We should not put up false barriers to reaching a commonly agreed framework, but it must be an agreed framework within the competencies of both our parliaments and operated in a spirit of cooperation by both our governments. Presiding officer, it's a new year. I know that 2019 may bring division and difficult differences between political parties to the fore on many issues. And at the right moment and on the right issue, I will be party to that too. I sometimes are. However, on this issue of designing a new and bespoke system of support for our rural economy that works, the rural economy secretary has a really difficult task, as I say, ahead of him, and we all need to make that extra effort to ensure that we don't create false divisions between us simply for party advantage. We have a real opportunity to create a new bespoke system that works for the benefit of the people that we represent. If we pass this motion today, the Rural Economy Secretary will have a clear way forward to create that successful new bespoke system. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now turn to the open part of the debate. Members have six minutes. There's not much time in hand, I'm afraid, or no time in hand. Gail Ross to be followed by Peter Chapman. When the Cabinet Secretary stood in this chamber last June and delivered a statement on the future of agricultural support post-Brexit transitional arrangements, he stated that one of the central conclusions of the Agricultural Champions report was that no change was not an option. He also cited the discussion paper published by the National Council of R Rural Advisors, who said, now is the time to change we think, act and operate to tailor bespoke policy frameworks. That date marked the start of a consultation to provide rural Scotland with stability and some sense of continuity when it comes to rural support payments. The Scottish Government launched a consultation, stability and simplicity, which focused on the arrangements that will need to be put in place in the period immediately after leaving the EU in March or whenever it actually happens. It asked what short-term simplifications could be made to help current claimants of CAP. It discussed how best to support and integrate agriculture into the broader rural economy. The consultation also asked how pilot projects might be developed and used to test different approaches, how to reduce the administrative burden, proposals to streamline and synergize some Pillar 2 schemes, and the creation of a transition period. And I welcome the Cabinet Sec Secretary's confirmation in his opening statement that we will commit to a five-year transition period as recommended by the Agricultural Champions. But if, as the motion says, we want to ensure key principles of a future rural support system that should seek to maintain flourishing communities, we cannot ignore the contribution that leader funding has made to our rural areas. Leader is part of the SRDP Pillar 2 funding. And in my constituency alone, in this tranche of funding from 2014 to 2020, 
It will invest 3.2 million on projects including farm diversification, electric vehicle training, road signage and many more. So far, 55 projects have been given a considerable boost in Caithness, Sutherland and Ross, with the added bonus of attracting other sources of funding, match funding and investment. To our small communities, this support from the EU cannot be understated. It has simply transformed the communities which have suffered decades of neglect from successive Westminster economic policies. The aim of leader funding is to increase support to local rural community networks, to build and modernise our wealth of knowledge and skills, it encourages innovation and cooperation in order to tackle local development objectives. This funding is the embodiment of the community empowerment policies laid down by this Parliament and I for one am very grateful for the support from our European friends to invest in these crucial developments. Meanwhile in Westminster we see the current progress of the Agriculture Bill which will no doubt have a third reading in the coming weeks. While the Scottish Government are doing everything possible to support and integrate agriculture into the broader rural economy, it is frustrating that the UK Bill still requires significant improvements to meet the aspirations of the industry here in Scotland. My SNP colleagues in Westminster have lodged amendments to that Bill to replace current EU geographical indicators in future UK legislation and to protect the quality of the domestic food supply by ensuring any imported foodstuffs are held to the same standards as domestic foodstuffs. Now these are only two examples that may seem simple enough, but unfortunately, the Tory government rejected both during the committee stage. So it will be interesting to see what approach is taken when the bill returns for a third reading. Or is this simply another example of the UK government abandoning our rural communities? Presiding officer, there have been many suggestions as to what a new agricultural support, support system could look like that should be based on food production rather than land area. It may not even be an agricultural system. It could be a countryside system that encompasses all our rural commitments, including biodiversity, forestry and the wider environment. Presiding officer, I'm going to conclude with a quote from the Scottish Rural Parliament's Engaging Scotland's Rural Communities on Brexit's policy statement. And I reference here my register of interests as a member of the Scottish Rural Parliament. And they say the EU brings a long history of support for peripheral rural and island areas, which has had a significant impact on the sustainability and development of rural and island areas. We need reassurance through clear commitments that the UK and Scottish Government will continue to meet the needs of rural people, places and enterprises. So I welcome the motion and the debate today and I'm happy to say that the Scottish Government has pledged to meet its commitment to rural Scotland. Thank you. Thank you and I call Peter Chapman to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. I thank you, Presiding Officer, and let me start by declaring an interest as a partner in a farming business. This is a crucial debate at a time when the future of a farming sector has never been so uncertain. Farmers across Scotland are desperate for some answers as to what their future holds, and quite frankly, they are watching with dismay and anger at the way many of our MSPs and MPs are putting short-term party politics ahead of our country's long-term prospects and prosperity. The outcome of Brexit is the big question on which all else hinges. If the deal negotiated between our UK government and the EU is passed next week, then we have some degree of certainty of a way forward. If it is voted down, as appears likely, because both Labour and SNP MPs have their own party politics to pursue, then we are headed for uncharted waters. Many people Many people don't want an, a no-deal Brexit, but the only sure way to avoid a no-deal Brexit is to vote for the yeah. only deal on the table. <laughs> MPs of all parties need to reflect on that. This morning's letter from the four UK NFUs is a stark reminder that no deal could be catastrophic for UK agriculture. Now, Fergus Ewan is well aware of the danger yet he blithely follows the party line that the SNP MPs will all vote against it for their own narrow party political reasons. Presiding officer, politics at its worst. 
Now, despite a plethora of various study groups set up by the Scottish Government, and I remind Mike Rumbles of just how many we've already had, we've got the Agricultural Champions, we've had the Council of Rural Advisors, we've had the Scottish Sheep Strategy Group, the Beef Strategy Group, the Fruit and Veg Group, the Greg's Greening Report, and another Agricultural Policy Simpl Simplification Task Force. And yet, despite all these groups, we still have no vision and no idea where this SNP government wants to take this industry. I haven't time, I'm sorry, Mike. I've only got six minutes. Indeed, I note from the motion that this government wants to convene yet another group. Now, Fergus Ewan should be, already be the best informed minister in history with all this advice, but it looks much more like an exercise of kicking the can down the road rather than coming up with any decisions. And setting up another group reinforces my fears that the Cabinet Secretary has no idea how to proceed. If I can get a wee bit of time, I will. Cabinet Secretary. In thanking Mr Chapman for giveaway, I mean, could, could I not remind him that this document, Stability and Simplicity, sets out a clear plan for five years and a clear majority of respondents, including many farmers and crofters, support our clear plans for the next five years. What part of that does Mr Chapman not understand? Peter Chapman. I understand it fine, but what it really says is that the status quo will remain until 2024, and then we don't know what's going to happen after that. So this is not good enough, presiding officer, not nearly good enough. The big prize available from Brexit is the ability to design a system of support much better suited to the needs of Scottish agriculture than the cap could ever be. And yet, two and a half years on, there is no vision and no plan. Now, the industry is also facing swinging cuts to LFAS payments. Now, the Cabinet Secretary just confirmed... Can we carry on? Mr Chapman can carry on, yes. Sorry, no, I, I, I really don't have time. I have a lot to say. The there is actually very little time, and it's up to Mr Chapman. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I would love to, but, I, I, you know, I, I have six minutes to, of a speech, and I, I really want to deliver it. The Cabinet Secretary has confirmed, confirmed only yesterday, that there will be a 20% cut this year and a 60% cut next year. But I, I, I hear what he says today. I absolutely welcome what he says today, but that was what was reported only yesterday. So, anyway... LFAS money, we all know, is vital to support farmers trying to eke out a living in some of our most remote and hardest land. And be in no doubt, cuts to LFAS, even at 80%, will result in back bankruptcies and land abandonment. And now, as well as lacking vision for the future of farming, we are also lacking the necessary legislative structure. And we are content that the Scottish Government has the legal basis to make payments under Pillar 1 and 2 for the 2019 payment year. However, we believe legislation is necessary to make payments in 2020 and beyond. As things stand, that legal basis does not exist. And the Scottish Government, unlike Northern Ireland and Wales, has declared that it will not take powers within the UK Government's Agricultural Bill. Therefore, the Scottish Government must produce a Scottish Agricultural Bill to ensure the ability to pay farmers and develop future policy from 2020 onwards. However, no mention of a Scottish Agricultural Bill was made in the Programme for Government, published in September, so hardly the sign of a government in control of events. Mm -hmm. Presiding officer, this industry deserves better. We need to recognise that our farmers' first priority is to produce high-quality food, but there is no way we can grow our food and drink industry to 30 billion by 2030 unless measures are put in place to properly fund this industry. Any new system put in place must be easier to apply, easy for, easier to administer, and targeted at the farmers producing the food we need. The new system must also recognise that 85% of our farmland is LFA and target extra support to these areas to maintain our high-quality red meat industry. It must also support a suite of environmental measures which all farmers can buy into simply there can be no tension between productive agriculture and high environmental standards. Both must go hand in hand. Presiding officer, this industry is at a piv pivotal point. Brexit negotiations are at a critical stage, creating huge uncertainty. On top of that, we have an SNP government which is presiding over huge cuts to LF LFAST payments. 
an SNP government which is even failing to put the necessary legislation in place to allow for future support payments, and an SNP government which has no vision for what our future support should look like. In short, an SNP government which is incompetent, tired, out of ideas, and failing our farmers. Yeah, yeah. Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Claudia Bewish. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and let me declare that I have a joint uh, ownership of a very small registered agricultural holding uh, from which uh, my wife and I derive no income whatsoever. Uh, let me start by agreeing with something that uh, Donald Cameron said, and I suspect the whole chamber can agree, um, that we should demand that our farmers uh, should be properly supported. But the debate is, of course, about what is proper support. And I always like to look at uh, what uh, the motions before us and the amendments before us are doing. And the very first and obvious thing, that the deletion that uh, is the very first part of the Conservative Amendment, the first uh, seven words that it deletes from the government motion is including fully replacing all lost EU funding. So we know straight away that the Conservatives are opposed to farming having the amount of funding that they currently get from the EU. So it ill behoves Peter Chapman or anyone else on the Conservative benches uh, to talk about uh, funding, to talk about lack of vision, to talk about kicking cans down the road. When the start reality is the Conservatives are opposed to farmers having all the funding that they currently have under the scheme. And that's a matter that we'll have to account to farmers for. Uh, the, 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 I'll, I'll just deal with the motion, the amendment first, if, if I may, I haven't quite finished. The amendment also ends and calls on the Scottish Government to ensure that it has sufficient legislative powers. Well, if it's got sufficient legislative powers, then it will legislate. But the Tories are clearly suggesting we do not have sufficient legislative powers and therefore cannot legislate. Now, I know that the, the, the motion that's before us is in the name of an advocate, uh, and I have many interesting and informed discussions uh, with him, uh, and I suspect that he just didn't read something that somebody put in front of him to the end, because it makes no sense to suggest we don't have sufficient legislative powers unless it is being suggested from the Conservatives that, as we have suggested, powers have been taken away. I will take Mr Cameron, but I will come back to Mr Chapman. Grateful for taking uh, Donald Cameron. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The point is uh, being made in the, that last sentence is that uh, without being part of the UK Agriculture Bill, you don't, you don't have the belt and braces approach mm. that the NFUS have said will provide clarity now. That is the lack of legislative power. Why do the SNP not, not agree with the Welsh Government and the Northern Ireland Administration that they too should be in the bill? I understand, the point, Stevenson. I understand the point that's been made in the debate, but I have to go back to the words that are on the page, which are uh, fundamentally different. I will now take Mr Chapman, if he wishes. Uh, yeah, I was... Uh, the, thank, I thank Peter the Chapman, the, sorry. <laughs> I, th I thank the member for taking the intervention. I, I want to come back on the fact that we don't want to see uh, agriculture fully funded in Scotland. Of course we want to see agriculture fully funded, and we support, we support the... the Money, the convergence money coming fully back to Scotland. We've always been in that position and that has never changed. Uh, can I say, Mr Stevenson, we're very that? short of time, no spare time at all, six to six minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I was conscious of that when I did it. But I wanted to be fair to the Conservatives because probably nobody else will be. Um, but uh, the bottom line, Presiding Officer, is including fully replacing lost EU fundings is being deleted by the Conservatives. And let's move on from that because enough has been said on that subject. We all, I think, accept that farming is a very important part of our economy, and especially our rural economy. At Christmas, I was delighted to sit down and everything on the table had come from no more than 50 miles uh, from home, and I hope that was the case for others. But that won't be the case uh, if we don't get the kind of environment that is important. Let me just pick up one or two points that I suspect others uh, won't pick on. Uh, looking at the National Council of Rural Advisors report and looking at some of the recommendations, um, some of the wider things beyond uh, support from government, uh, 
Action 4B in that report, ensure equitable access to finance for rural communities and businesses, including a simplified grant system. And that's, that's great. Uh, however, when I pick up the Scottish Rural Action uh, report that I got from the stand uh, yesterday, it focuses, of course, on Royal Bank Closers, a publicly owned bank by the uh, uh, government down south. And if we take banks out of communities, it's going to be a heck of a difficult. So it's not just about funding farmers, it's about uh, the total uh, infrastructure that we have. It also goes on at uh, 8B to talk about micro-enterprises and encouraging uh, women and young people. And I very uh, much uh, support that. I think that is an excellent way. But the bottom line, that I think uh, the Conservatives at Westminster in particular uh, have to think about is what is the effect of creating barriers between uh, Scotland, the UK for that matter, and one of our biggest markets in the EU. The National Farmers Union Scotland and others farmers union have called for frictionless trade. If we're not in the single market, we don't have frictionless trade. And if we don't have free movement of people, as the ministerial statement before this debate highlighted, we're going to find it very difficult to start farms. Not just strawberry farms in Fife, but raspberry farms in Fife. I once worked on one many, many uh, donkeys years ago. And that is to the very heart of the problem that confronts us. Yes, it's about farming direct to farmers, but it's about the total system. It's not looking terribly good, presiding officer. Claudia Beamish, followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to contribute to this debate. I want to start by addressing some of the climate change challenges as it is part of my brief. Agriculture and related land use sectors are Scotland's biggest, second biggest um, greenhouse gas emitters. And yet they seem to be the sectors with perhaps the weakest leadership from Scottish Government. The latest climate change plan asked for uh, only a small 9% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and went against the recommendations of this Parliament's um, uh, Eclair Committee and the UK Committee on Climate Change. Much more is indeed possible, but only if this government improves the system in many ways and provides support and, I stress, advice that enables farmers to be both productive and envir environmentally conscious. This is not a false dichotomy, as many farmers already know, and it is great to see growing instances of knowledge sharing and perception shifting in farms across the country. Many farmers are already adapting to support each other with best practice, and it has been clearly demonstrated by the recent lead um, on, a, in, on, on a ban on burning farm plastics, how this has been taken up. And let us also note that in England, the NFU has called for net zero agricultural emissions by 2040 which is indeed inspiring. Farmers are amongst those in the front line of the global challenge, and we also rely on them and land managers to help us to reach net zero more easily by playing an increasing role in sequestration. The agriculture industry is on a longer journey than the decarbonisation of much big business or electricity, for example, and could be the sector that could benefit most from a just transition commission with a long-term purpose set well beyond the two years the current commission is set for. Climate-friendly farming is full of win-wins that can be shared between farmers, the planet, and the public. NFUS has sent a briefing on climate change issues today, and I want to highlight some of these challenges and how they may be addressed in my speech. One such is that data held on agriculture emissions is flawed in relation to the agriculture sector, in, in my view and doesn't recognise much of what farmers do on a farm basis, such as peatland restoration and forestry. Farmers have said to me that carbon audits don't fairly reflect their climate commitment, and I hope the uh, Cabinet Secretary will consider this in his closing remarks. The Government motion today calls for a togetherness of food uh, production and stewardship of land. I agree with this holistic approach. Considering our land and food production as a public good is the right approach for a more sustainable farming system. And this principle could deliver benefits to local communities, wider society, the environment, and indeed to future generations. This fusion of purposes should be intricate to and intrinsic to any new farm payment in my view. Uh, and what work is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that pillar two environmental payments are far more integrated as a priority rather than just an add-on? 
And if it is our aim, then perhaps agro agroecology is a way to consider to achieve this. All farming and food production can sustain and restore the natural environment, not further deplete natural capital, either in Scotland or in countries uh, where we import feed from. This government has promised Scotland is to be a world leader in green farming, but it still has a long way to go to promote and plan for this sort of model and, uh, as the way that we do our farming, the way we teach our farming in colleges, the way we do research and the way we, do, the way we design public support for farming. Has the Cabinet Secretary looked at models in other countries, such as in France, where they have a basic law on agroecology, agro which has been introduced? In this context, I want to turn our thoughts to the present agri-environment schemes and ask the uh, Chamber and, indeed, the Cabinet Secretary to reflect on the words of the Vice Chairman of the Clydesdale branch of the NFUS and an upland beef and sheep farmer from Crawford John in South Lanarkshire, Tom French. He says, I think the current, that currently only a small percentage of farm businesses have achieved access to the agri-environment schemes in spite of many more wishing to do so. One of the main reasons for this is the, the lack of uptake, is the work involved in preparing applications and the costs involved. And sometimes even small farmers feel an obligation to, to go towards a, a consultant to prepare their application and can, can spend um, around £2,000, as Tom French says, um, with absolutely no guarantee of success. These measures and restrictions are very inflexible. And perhaps, he goes on, the solution would be to guarantee entry to possibly a tiered scheme with the entry level measures for all businesses which they could access should they wish with management measures and restrictions and I stress this point drawn up in conjunction with individual farmers with a ceiling limit I also stress this point he makes a ceiling limit uh, on, on what any business could receive and I would think that this would bring multiple benefits he says and also would enhance the green credentials of the industry farmers work often in isolation in challenging weather conditions, as we know, and better advice and support are vital for sustainable development. As one of the Scottish Co-op uh, Party group of MSPs, I've attended past Scottish Agricultural Organisation Society conferences, and this year's conference is entitled Promoting Innovation. Opportunities for uh, support for cooperative working are very important to farmers and the EU unfortunately questioned the Pillar 2 Cooperation Fund which had to be abandoned. I hope that the, um, the Cabinet Secretary might in his closing remarks talk about the real place that there is you for a must future fund now, please, in Minish. terms of also the catchment levels uh, for, for flooding and collaboration that this leads. Thank you. Gillian Martin followed by John Scott. Officer, it would be very obvious from every speech I've given in this chamber on the subject that I'm a supporter of staying in the European Union and I struggle to find any positives to Brexit. When it comes to the financial benefits of membership, agriculture in Scotland is one of the main be beneficiaries and those benefits will have been outlined many, many times by various members in the last two years. However, we are where we are and we must seriously contemplate and plan for a Scottish farming future which does not have access to the funding support that's been given to us as part of our EU membership. Questions still remain as to the replacement for that funding but our current situation could give us a chance to at least start from scratch and build a new system that throws out everything about CAP that was problematic and actively tackles the challenges that the land use sector is facing as we go through the 21st century and takes into account Scotland's particular diversity, particularly geographically. My understanding of farming support that it is uh, largely there for three key things, to protect our domestic qu uh, quality of food supply, to support the management of the land and environment and to help support rural communities to thrive through job creation. Are we currently achieving all those things? I think that's the question we must ask ourselves as we debate what a new system should look like. Over the last week, uh, largely, I've, I've reached out to a number of my farming contacts, both professional and personal, and asked them a, it's a very simple question. What would you like to see in a new support system? And I've uh, also, at the convener of the Environment, Le Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, been party to a great deal of discussion from various land use stakeholders on how the system can support farmers as they play their part in tackling climate change. So every opinion expressed in the remainder of my speech is reflective of the feedback that I've had from all those people. Um, and uh, 
very high in the list of feedback was a system that encouraged more new entrants into farmers and colleagues at the Scottish Rural Parliament in Parliament this week have mentioned that to me and um, have, have echoed quite a lot of the sentiments that Rhoda Grant had in her speech about the unfairness and the imbalance of funding between small and large farms. And I was really encouraged to hear the Cabinet Secretary make the commitment today that smaller concerns will be treated more fairly than the CAP system and dispense with the punitive penalties that cause so much stress and heartache for those with a tighter margin. A good few of my correspondents mentioned the need for a funding system to also include start-up grants to allow minorities, young people and women to enter the sector. John File, the chair of the National Sheep Association of Scotland and a neighbour of mine at Cityton Farm in Streloch near Newmacker, was very critical of the tenure system. And top of his list was a system that is based on business structure, paid out for farms that created jobs for people and discouraged payment for existence rather than activity. He said, and this is a quote, we need a system that supports those with the most to offer, not the most to lose. He said, public money should be used for those who are investing in producing quality food for the nation, working to ensure the environment is left in better condition, those creating employment and protecting communities. Subsidy should be a stimulant not a right that belongs to an individual regardless of activity. And one of my go-to sounding boards on women in agriculture, Joyce Campbell, who farms in Gail Ross's constituency, said active farming is key, as is membership of Quality Meat Scotland for those in livestock, for the guarantee of welfare standards. Dave Tucker, who also is a Highland sheep farmer, said, we have no excuse not to embrace change, and those who do so should be rewarded. Support for protecting and preserving soils is a no-brainer. The, these are our national assets and they should be protected and enhanced for future generations. Farmers are one of our key temporary custodians of the land. Many people have made that, that point today. But their efforts, which benefit the wider environment, should be recognised and built into a funding system. Um, we should be incentivising people to farm sustainably in business terms and environmental terms. Those actively reducing emissions, those producing uh, quality food in ways that enhance and protect the environment, those actively encouraging biodiversity on their land, for example, restoring, preserving peat bogs, those using area of lands for, for, for tree growth, alongside food produce, should be incentivised and encouraged. My correspondence also echoed many of the points already made in this debate about continuing leader funding, particularly Gail Ross has mentioned that, and recognising the responsibility we have to the wider economic and community benefits agriculture brings. Presiding officer, the other points raised by my contacts could be summed up like this. Any new system of funding must at least match the volume currently gained by EU membership and tailored to the particular needs of Scotland particularly those farming in the remotest places that have the most challenges. It must be simplified. It must not be close to new entrants, tenant farmers and smallholders. It must reward and encourage knowledge exchange, good welfare practice, um, profitable, fair and innovative business models and environmental sustainability. And it must dispense with any mechanisms that encourage inactivity. Most of all, it must ensure that Scotland remains food secure and that all of us know that most of, food in our most of the food on our plate is local, of a high standard, and has created jobs in our localities. But, presiding officer, before, one final thing before I sit down. Almost everyone I spoke to said the same thing. They wanted all political parties to work together to really realise these goals. Thank you. John Scott, followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, presiding officer. And may I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and food producer and member of NFUS, and welcome this debate about post-Brexit Scottish agriculture and recognise for the first time in my lifetime we in Scotland essentially have a blank sheet of paper on how to shape a bespoke policy for Scottish land use in general and agriculture in particular. Some of the known parameters are available budgets as promised by the UK Government until 2022, the current lack of profitability of Scottish farming, the need for Scottish agriculture, to reduce its greenhouse gas emission to help keep planetary temperature rise to a minimum. And having established some of the parameters, we now have to define our ambition. And for me, having spent much of my life farming and fighting for farmers and crofters' livelihoods, as well as fighting for the preservation and enhancement of our landscapes, no one will be surprised to learn that my vision is for working landscapes, which builds on the NAVU concept of actively farmed hectares and offers a more holistic approach to land use in Scotland. 
because working landscapes self-evidently require people in those landscapes to work at delivering on food production and forestry and environmental enhancement and tourism and creating and maintaining our renewable energy systems and maintaining our road and rail infrastructure and building strong and integrated communities supported by strong and resilient rural businesses. So the first priority in this objective is the need for rural businesses to be profitable. And indeed, in the context of this debate on agriculture, farm business particularly need to become profitable for the production of livestock and red meat to continue in Scotland. Already, there is barely enough livestock produced in Scotland to support our growing food exporting businesses. And there are tens of thousands of hectares that used to be carry livestock only 30 years ago that no longer does. And one can only conclude the pathway chosen by the Scottish Government is to create still more wilderness landscapes without people in them. Turning now to Elfast, and as a past convener of the NFUS Hill Farming Committee, I know how important Elfast payments are to the 85% of Scotland that is classified as less favoured area. So the 20% reduction being proposed by the Scottish Government for next year, which was proposed, it was proposed would go to a 60% reduction the following year would have been completely unacceptable as these cuts would have driven many more farmers and food producers out of business and off their land. Cabinet Secretary, there are no financial reserves left in many LFA farming businesses, as you will be all too well aware, following many years of declining profitability as demonstrated by your own TIF figures and blaming the cap of the European Union or the UK government is not acceptable when it is apparently, allegedly, in your gift and at your discretion to maintain these payments at current levels. And I welcome your commitment today that future payments will not fall below 80% of current levels, although a 20% reduction will still be unsustainable. And I hope you will make Lord Bew aware of this in your discussions with him. And of course, everyone accepts that we need more timber production now more than ever to support our timber processing industry. But driving people off the land and leaving crumbling empty steadings, farmhouses and cottages is not the way to go about it. Cabinet Secretary, creating your own hill and upland clearances is not what you want to be remembered for or indeed deserve to be remembered for. So a balance has to be struck and people supported in our countryside with land use prioritised. And this is a job for the Scottish Government using the tools at their disposal, the most important one being the ability to disperse financial support to deliver on the rural objectives. Farmers and crofters have for many years now demanded that activity as a benchmark for the delivery of support and willingly accepted that this should also require the delivery of public goods at the same time. And, presiding officer, this concept of delivering public goods should in future, in my view, apply not just to agriculture but to forestry to renewable energy production, to housing and tourism grants, and generally to all rural industries in receipt of public money as well. In addition, to help restore profitability, collaborative working should be a government-supported option to allow those who wish to work together to get a better return from the marketplace. And again, this concept of cooperation supported by SOS should apply to all Scottish rural industries, be it tourism, food or timber production or energy production. Better delivered locally, better delivered further education provision and knowledge transfer in our rural areas is going to be required as well to both understand the new complexities of a post-Brexit rural Scotland as well as understand and deal with the complexities of a carbon reduction and climate change across all the sectors mentioned. And certainly the decision by SRUC to withdraw that capability from UWS air is amongst SRUC's poorest decisions yet, and goodness knows they've made many, and another hammer blow to the Ayrshire rural economy, and indeed should be reversed, Cabinet Secretary, in my view, as you know. Um, turning now to the government motion, Scottish Conservatives remain to be convinced that we might benefit from yet another representative advisory committee being set up to advise the Scottish Government on the content of a new Scottish Agriculture Bill. Surely enough advice has already been given to the Cabinet Secretary. However, what is important is that the Cabinet Secretary makes up his mind soon on the content of the new Scottish Agriculture Bill we will require, the more so if there is not going to be a Scottish schedule in the UK Agriculture Bill, and get a document into the public domain for discussion. 
Presiding officer, the next Scottish Agricultural Bill is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to do so much more than just deliver agricultural support, essential as that is. And it is an opportunity that should be seized with both hands, and the sooner the better. Thank you. Emma Harper, followed by Maureen Watt. Very tight six-minute speeches, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate about the future of our rural policy and support in Scotland. Since coming to this place as a newbie in May 2016, I've been actively involved with our rural and our agricultural communities. And since my election, I've had the opportunity to learn from many experts, from NFUS and SRUC, to the Scottish Sheep Association and the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association. And I'd like to thank them all for their willingness to engage and inform me about policy and issues across rural Scotland, and even pr providing suggestions for changes that need to be made. In recent meetings with all of these organisations, and indeed farmers across South West Scotland, one thing has been clear, Brexit is causing much concern, anxiety and uncertainty. I do not need to remind Chamber that Scotland's farmers and rural communities receive valuable support from the EU and with a chaotic UK government reluctant to provide clarity over future funding arrangements, I'm pleased that we have a Scottish Government standing up for our rural communities, our farmers and our agricultural workers. Prior to recess, I attended the Scottish Rural Parliament hosted by Scottish Rural Action held in Stranraer and I'd like to mention some of the points raised by Scottish Rural Action in their annual report, which I know many of the members across Chamber will have read also. SRA are asking for both the Scottish and UK governments for a commitment to equality for our rural people, our places and businesses in Scotland to ensure they are not forgotten and are considered in any policy and decision making. This idea of not being forgotten is becoming a theme for me. Earlier this week, I spoke in the members' debate in chamber about the need for further and major infrastructure investment in the southwest of Scotland roads, where many constituents, constituents say they feel forgotten. I therefore seek assurances from the Cabinet Secretary that our rural people, communities and businesses will be supported by this Scottish Government because they are crucial not only to our rural economy, but to Scotland's economy. Presiding officer, another of SRA's asks, and in my view one of the most important, is the need for the UK and Scottish governments to attract migrant workers as well as their families to come live and work and be, and be integrated members of our communities. These families help keep our rural communities functioning. Their children attend our rural schools, they work in our farms and in our care sector and in our small and micro businesses, of which we have dozens in the South West Scotland, and they add to our diverse and open society here in Scotland. However, their future has been put in question by a chaotic and out of touch government that is imposing a salary of £30,000 cap on their tier two visas for EU migrants coming to Scotland. Many of these EU workers will not earn this amount of money. It is all very well that the UK government has proposed a seasonal agricultural worker scheme, but Scottish dairy farms, of which 48% are in the South Scotland region, are not seasonal. These farms rely on 24-7, 365 days a year workers to milk cows and clean out the sheds and look after the, 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 the beasts and carry out complex jobs such as artificial insemination even, as well as some supportive vet care. I would therefore seek assurances from the Cabinet Secretary that the Scottish Government is actively lobbying the UK Government to press for this unrealistic UK Government migrant salary cap to be scrapped. The, no, I don't have time actually, sorry. The Green Amendment proposes addressing agricultural emissions and this is an area I am interested in as a former member of the Environment uh, and Climate Change Committee. Just this morning I met with representatives from Biocell Agri and Triset UK. Both companies are promoting products that help improve the efficiency of ruminants and efficiency of slurry processing and the promotion of soil health improvement products and I will be writing to the cabinet secretary to follow up from this meeting as I would like the government to be aware of and perhaps even support these types of products. Biocell and Triset are about innovation, sustainability and profitability. The Labour and Conservative amendments both talk about LFAS support for sheep farmers and as well as receiving LFAR support, there is an additional economic consideration in that 
year on year, we are seeing a rise in the number of attacks on sheep by out-of-control dogs, which is having a direct negative economic and emotional impact on the farmers. I want to ask that all members get behind the consultation that I'm about to launch in order to ensure we get the legislation right for our farmers, because the consequences of livestock attacks can be traumatic and tragic for both the animal and the farmer. I am also extremely grateful for the fantastic support that I have been given over this work from many organisations, including NFUS, NSA, SRUC, Police Scotland, SSPCA and others. Presiding officer, finally, our rural economy is diverse. It is multinational. It is not just about one particular group. For example, from my time as an MSP, I have met deer farmers, beekeepers, chilli growers and even oyster farmers. I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has published the most comprehensive Brexit paper on farming from any other government or devolved administration anywhere in the UK. And I urge the Scottish Government to continue to stand up for rural Scotland and to ensure our agricultural sector continues to thrive, is attractive and welcomes all, regardless of their background or indeed where they come from. The last of the open debate contributions is from Maureen Mort. Officer, uh, fortunately, the opportunities this debate presents have not been totally usurped by the shambles that is Brexit, which the Tories in this place continue to try to defend, knowing in their heart of hearts that it will be catastrophic for Scottish farming. We all know that farming in Scotland is vastly different from the rest of the UK, not least because of the vast tracts of less favoured areas we have in Scotland a fact recognised in the motion and some of the amendments. This, of course, is why the agriculture is a devolved competence and was prior to devolution. The fact that the Westminster government has taken the powers over Scottish agriculture to itself is an outrage. And so I'm very pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has announced today that there will be an agriculture bill presented to this parliament. And I look forward to scrutinising it in the rural affairs and on Connectivity Committee. The Tories during the debate have asked us to get involved with the current agriculture bill going through Westminster. But why should we, when we can have a bill of our own, and as Gail Ross has said, that they have not adopted any of the amendments put forward by our colleagues in Westminster? The UK agricultural bill will impose unwanted policies and rules on Scottish farmers in areas of devolved competency. For example, as drafted, as drafted, it could affect the Scottish Parliament's ability to provide support for active beef and sheep farmers. The House of Lords Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee is wholly damning of the Agriculture Bill as drafted. It states the Agriculture Bill represents a major transfer of powers from the EU to ministers of the Crown, bypassing Parliament and the devolved legislatures. Parliament will not be able to debate the merits of the new agricultural regime because the bill doesn't contain even an outline of the substantive law that will replace the cap after the UK leaves the EU. It continues, at this stage, it cannot even be said that the devil is in the detail because the bill contains so little detail. Significantly, powers are exercisable indefinitely and without sunset clauses that the Tories in this place are always calling for. We are not convinced by the need for such extensive powers to be conferred on ministers indefinitely. In contrast, the Stability and Simplicity paper published in June last year set out this government's detailed plan to minimise the potential disruption of Brexit on our rural communities. This is dependent, of course, on the UK government honouring its commitments to replacing the lost EU funding in full. And we all know their history on this is not favourable. Presiding officer, we have a wealth of talent and ambition for our rural, rural communities, not least demonstrated by the number of briefings we've had for this debate today from so many organisations. They are brimful of ideas and recommendations to the government for the future of our rural communities. 
As a farmer's daughter, I still remain convinced that the primary use of our land should be where appropriate and as far as possible, the sus sustainable food production. Although there is much that we cannot grow because of the temperate climate, um, and obviously we will continue to have to import, there is so much we can grow for our own use and to export to offset our import food bill. The growth in our food and drink production and export has been spectacular over the last few years and is based on the quality of the product, the purity of the environment in which it is grown and the ambitions of those in the sector. As the Cabinet Secretary said in his opening speech, he has listened to many, including the National Council of Rural Advisors. Representing the health portfolio at Cabinet one, the day uh, that they came to Cabinet, I had the opportunity to hear their presentations of their findings to Cabinet, and I was blown away by the analysis, initiatives and sheer enthusiasm of the rural economy from, the, uh, from Alison Milne, co-convener convener of the group. One of their recommendations is recognising the strategic importance of the rural economy and mainstreaming it within all policies and decision-making processes. Currently, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee is scrutinising the South of Scotland Enterprise Bill. As we know, it's the centre of Scotland's dairy production, yet currently it's not embedded as a potential growth uh, potential for growth in that area by Scottish Enterprise. So the opportunities of the South of Scotland uh, Enterprise Bill um, are there to be seen. Uh, uh, in other recommendations, they dovetail uh, in their document, they dovetail into this that they call for a rural economic strategy, putting the rural economy at the heart of the national economic plan. And it says it is significant that the Scottish Government embraced this idea in their programme for government. The motion and the announcement today confirm that this government is, as always, putting the interests of our rural economy at the heart of everything it does. We now move to the closing speeches. And again, I would stress that I have no time in hand. John Finney, up to six minutes, please. Hey, thank you, President Officer. I, I think this has been a very interesting debate, and, and what could be more important at this time? And the Cabinet Secretary sets us off by giving us the time frame within which um, we are operating and the uncertainty caused by uh, Brexit. Uh, we certainly, uh, the Scottish Green Party, welcome the announcement of a, a Scottish bill. I think that's very welcome. Um, of course, it's not just policy, it is support, and that's a, 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 an important factor. Um, like others, I'm very grateful for, for the, the briefings that have been. Um, the many briefings we've received, Scottish Environmental Link calls on the government to set up a process. Um, and indeed, it's the process that's outlined in the Scottish Government motion um, and uh, long championed by my colleague in the REC committee, Mike Rumbles. And I think it's very important that we do have uh, a, a group consisting producers, uh, consumers and environmental organisations to inform and recommend a bespoke process. I think that's very important. Um, and the, the Environment Link call on us to help deliver the sustainable goals, which Scotland was among the first nations to sign up to. And uh, uh, having a look at the 17 sustainable, there's a, there's a number uh, that are highly pertinent to zero hunger, clean water and sanitation, responsible consumption and production, climate action and life and land. And others have alluded to that. Um, it's also part of the Scottish Government's national performance framework. Now, we have a climate emergency, and I think it's, it's, it's important to say that. And among uh, one of the briefings we got, um, and indeed that briefing arrived at uh, 13.22 hours today, uh, was from then in few Scotland. And I, I'd like to quote from it. Um, I, they, they state that uh, crofters, uh, farmers and crofters are on the front line in experiencing the impacts of climate change. And I think that's irrefutable. Uh, Agriculture is a source of greenhouse gas emissions and farmers and crofters are a big part in helping tackle the collective challenge we face. I think that's a, a very honest assessment. Disappointingly, disappointingly, the first bullet point in the briefing is a future emissions target of net zero for Scottish agriculture is unrealistic as food production necessarily involves emissions. Now, m my colleague touched on that, Mark Ruskell, and, and indeed uh, my colleague Claudia Beamish touched on that. And, if life is challenging, and we must push ourselves. And, and what I would like to commend, in, in a spirit of 
consensus is the position adopted by the National Farmers Union south of the border when on the 16th of October, and, and this has been uh, touched on already, but it is worthy of repetition. The, uh, the decision, um, the UN report warning that CO2 emissions must be stopped completely to avoid danger, dangerous climate disruption, um, and we saw Green GB Week uh, was designed to raise debate in society about how to tackle that. Now, I'd like to quote uh, from the NFU Deputy President Guy Smith, and he said, and I quote, last week's report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, was a final alarm call for the from the science community. The rise in global temperature must be limited to 1.5 degrees. Farmers and growers have weathered extremes of cold, drought, and flood so far this year, and we are ready to play our part in a global move towards net zero emissions. Now, everyone seems very happy that we have a, an evidence-based approach, and, and I'm not hearing anyone say necessarily that we want more of the same. What's important going ahead is the very issue that, again, the Cabinet Secretary rightly um, challenged one of the speakers about, and that was the level of engagement. That's there, it's manifest in the motion. I think it's important that everyone plays their part in that. Um, and of course, um, it's not a level playing field. There are very great variations uh, across our country. And uh, I want to quote from a, a news release uh, from uh, yesterday or today. Um, uh, Crofting must get support for, dis uh, for disadvantage. That is, that is the case. And um, um, we will be supporting the Labour Party amendment. And I would align myself with some of the comments made by my, my colleague Rhoda Grant there about the challenges faced and that, as I said, it's not a, a, a uniform situation. Now, um, public money for public goods, everyone seems very happy with that. Um, and I want to quote again from one of the briefings, the strongest justification for using public funds to support farming, crofting and forestry is that these activities can produce a wide range of environmental and social goods and services, public goods, that are not rewarded through markets. And it is the relationship between support for the producer and the market that is very important. Um, and it goes on to say support to land managers should therefore be tailored accordingly. And again, I don't think I've heard anyone say any different from that. Because we're rightly, uh, we are custodians of public money with the decisions we make here. And I think it's very important that we uh, ensure that these funds are dispersed sensibly and to the, the general benefit rather than individual benefit. And uh, that, uh, again, one of the principles that indeed Environment Link talk about is a business-based and plan-led principle that would, again, be part of the evidence process. So um, I would commend, I, I haven't, uh, I would hope people would uh, understand that, uh, the position adopted by the NU if south of the border isn't one that's been adopted recklessly. They want to play their part. I would remind people what our amendment says. We insert the phrase agrees that agriculture report is a key tool in addressing the climate emergency and emissions from agriculture and land use and that future funding should help develop a net zero emissions farming sector in Scotland. Um, I would hope no one could take issue with that. I suspect that we, we, we are not going to be supported um, in, uh, with that particular uh, uh, aspect. But uh, I think it's very important, as others have said, that in this very important issue of policy development in this very important sector, they will work as consensually as possible. Thank you. Colin Smith, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. This is, has been a, a welcome, if very long overdue debate. Getting support for rural communities right post-Brexit is crucial, not only to sectors such as agriculture, but to Scotland's economy as a whole. Agriculture is a vital source of jobs and income in our rural areas, but it's also the foundation of a food and drink sector worth billions of pounds and countless jobs across all of Scotland. Yet it's one of the sectors most at risk by the utter chaos of the current Brexit process. So during this time of uncertainty, we need as much direction and clarity on the future as possible, which so far has not been forthcoming from either the UK or Scottish governments. I therefore welcome the commitment given today by the Scottish Government to at long last agree to bring together a truly wide range of stakeholders to inform policy and the direction going forward. The clock is ticking towards leaving the EU and with it the common agricultural policy and there are a great deal of ideas and agreement from many stakeholders and what our aims, priorities and direction of travel should be from steps to change by the National Farmers Unions I certainly will, yeah. Fergus Ewing. Most grateful to Mr Smith for giving way. I mean, d does he not accept, and to be fair to us, that, that this document, Stability and Simplicity, which forms really the basis of this debate, does 
provide clarity, certainty, financial certainty, and the prospect of stability for the period of five years. And in that respect, it's uh, given its welcome from a majority of stakeholders in the consultation. That's something that all of us should really be able to welcome. Colin Smith. I welcome that, but what producers and, and rural communities want is long-term stability and a long-term vision for the future of rural support. Farming does not plan on the basis of one, two, three years. It plans beyond five years, and we need to get the detail right beyond that five-year period. So that's why I agree with the, the government's decision to bring forward uh, a group of stakeholders. Harnessing the consensus that I think is out there from many stakeholders is important. It's also critical to providing farmers, crofters, food and drink producers in the wider rural community with the long-term vision and long-term stability they need. As the Cabinet Secretary said in his opening remarks, one of the challenges to setting out the detail of our new system is uncertainty from the UK Government on funding. Now, I share that frustration, but I don't think this prevents us making the case for the resources to meet the unique needs of Scotland's rural communities and agriculture sector, and doing so by putting forward credible, detailed plans showing what a new Scottish system should look like in the long term. A system which is evidence-based, that better targets support at those who need it most, and that incentivises the change we need to see. A system that promotes not only growth, but inclusive growth, tackles deprivation in rural communities and helps put an end to the scandal of food poverty. Well, direct payments make up the bulk of current funding and it is one of the areas where reform is needed most. Significant sums of money are given to large, often wealthy owners uh, in such payments, yet 45% of farms generate income that works out below the minimum agricultural wage. Funding needs to be allocated more fairly and according to the principle of public good for public money. And the new scheme should have clear coherent policy aims in any schemes taken forward. Now, Labour believes protecting some, of, some element of basic payments is important, but we need to move the emphasis towards targeted and conditional payments, such as the ones currently paid under Pillar 2. These two sources of support should be integrated to provide a simplified and cohesive system, and over time, the proportion of funding spent on land-based payments should be reduced with a cap placed on the amount an individual or single organisation can receive. Additional agricultural payments should be focused on three broad priorities, redressing natural disadvantages, promoting environment uh, and social benefits and improving productivity. Redressing natural disadvantages such as biophysical constraints and remoteness is essential. A number of speakers have emphasised Elfast and as Jane Craig, Chair of National Farmers Union in Clydesdale said, I cannot highlight enough the importance of Elfast. The Cabinet Secretary needs to guarantee not only that he will protect against the upcoming 60% cut, but also that a source of support of this kind will be made available in the long term. But a greater emphasis on social and environmental benefit is the key change that needs to be made to our support system. This means incentivising best practice and helping to fund measures that provide a public good. As Claudia Beamish stressed, support and environmental sustainability in the sector, taking into account factors such as emissions, biodiversity and air and soil quality is also crucial. Likewise, improvements to the culture and conditions on farms and crofts should be incentivised to underpin good working conditions and animal welfare, with a particular emphasis that grows ethical farming practices. There's also a need to improve productivity. Beyond agricultural support, a range of other vital schemes are currently provided through the Scottish Rural Development Programme that need to be replicated following Brexit. The new entrance scheme, which is currently closed for the foreseeable future, is of huge importance to the long-term sustainability of the sector. And as Rhoda Grant and Gail Ross stressed, the leader scheme is vital as a vital source of support and funding for a range of rural projects and recreating an equivalent scheme for Scotland in the long term is absolutely essential. Crucially, in the support we provide rural Scotland, we need to see a greater emphasis on tackling poverty in Scotland, be it within rural communities where the problem can often be hidden or the scandal of food poverty across all of Scotland. As Rhoda Grant also said, the Scottish Government's lack of commitment to a Good Food Nations Bill with the right to food at its heart remains deeply disappointing. Finally, any new support scheme must put inclusive growth at the very heart to ensure that all areas of Scotland benefit from any new system. President officer, in concluding, Labour is pleased the Scottish Government are at long last beginning the process of developing the details of a new rural support system and bringing a wide range of stakeholders together to help achieve that in a consensual, consensual way. European funding may no longer be coming our way, but the case for additional support for rural Scotland is absolutely clear and has been stressed 
here today. Although the somewhat petty uh, decision... You must close, please, Mr Stewart. Thank you. Although the somewhat petty decision by the SNP to oppose Labour's recent amendment today suggests the usual barriers may exist at the top of the Scottish Government, Labour is committed to working with all stakeholders you must to ensure close, the please. process debated today provides the change needed to deliver the ambitions of rural Scotland. Edward Mountain, up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to refer members to my register of interest, specifically farming, and to be absolutely clear and to avoid any dubiety, my family farming partnership receives payments under the current schemes, including LFAS. I welcome this afternoon's debate, but I, like many others who understand farming, will feel let down with the slow progress that we have seen over the last year. I had hoped the new year might herald a more constructive approach from the Cabinet Secretary and a bill for the Scottish uh, sorry, a time scale for the bill for the... I'll get that out in a minute. A time scale for a Scottish agriculture bill. But we don't seem to have heard that. I believe he's still putting politics before farmers and sound bites before the rural economy. Now, we've heard this afternoon from many speakers, and before I pick up on what they have said, I want to focus on two points, future policy and LFAS. Now, the Cabinet Secretary's views on Brexit are clear, and he makes them clear on every single opportunity. He's shown a lack of commitment, in my mind, to prepare rural businesses for the future, hiding behind numerous task forces and consultations and showing a lack of vision and leadership. And if he holds up the simplicity and stability document, again, with its 46 questions in it, I will begin to wonder where the answers are. Now, let me contrast that with when he deals with Scottish fishermen. There's no observation or prevarication there. Just the promise he's going to get them the very best deal under Brexit. That, to me, Cabinet Secretary, is shameless politicking. It's led him into a trap. It's a trap that he can't implement any changes to the rural policy until he gets on and produces an agricultural bill in Scotland. And I urge him to do that. And I don't believe, like as we've heard from speakers this afternoon, there is any problem with the Belt and Braces approach of joining him with the UK agricultural bill. Now, this shameless politicking, as I've seen it, has extended to the LFAS payments. Now, the Cabinet Secretary always takes time to remind me of things that I have said in the past. Let me remind him of some of the things he said in relation to the importance of LFAST. And Cabinet Secretary, for, you, for your benefit, here are the dates. 21st of June, LFAST is vital for our rural economy and rogue communities. 30, 13th of September 2018, I have said to local farmers and NFUS members that we are absolutely committed to finding a way round to avoiding the 80% reduction in LFAS. 31st of October 2018 to the Rural Economy and, Connect and Connectivity Committee, we've made it clear in stability and simplicity that reducing LFAS payments to 20% is unacceptable. However, those are the rules of the scheme. So we've indicated in our consultation paper that we will need to find a workaround for the recipients. I am determined, he goes on to say, to find that workaround. My officials are working very hard on the issue, and I think it's within our reach. And I hope that we're approaching the issue in a practical way. So, Cabinet Secretary, as to the workaround for LFAS for next year, what have you achieved? You've achieved a 20% cut. That's £13 million out of the rural economy from the areas that probably need it most. Now, serious questions need to be asked I think, why you haven't found a workaround to the problem and how you're going to find a workaround for the further reduction that is looming at us unless you can find a way around the state aid rules. And I'd like to hear how that is. Now, that to me shows a complete lack of simplicity and stability from your policy. It's neither simple nor stable. Now, turning to some of the important points that have been raised by others, I think uh, Donald Cameron's point that no deal is not a good position to be in is, is a vital one to remember. So if you don't want a no deal position, you've got to look seriously at the deal on the table instead of writing it off at every possible opportunity. I also agree with Donald Cameron that we should look at being part of the UK Agricultural Bill. There's no power grab, that's politics speaking. I agree, I, sorry, if you want to interrupt from a sedentary position, stand up and ask for interruption. If not, Mr. Brown, I suggest you, you leave your comments till later. Turning to Rhoda Grant, <laughs> turning to Rhoda Grant, I believe that, that she's right when she says that this government's statement lacks ambition. But I also agree with her totally that public funding should be for the public good. 
And I also agreed with what Mark Ruskell said this afternoon. Let's have a debate about the issue. I agree. Now, I also agree with something else that he said in relation to net zero. Before we can get down to that, we need to identify all that farmers are achieving already in the countryside to be able to identify net, how net zero can be achieved. Because I think farmers are undervalued for what they're achieving. The example I think given of the Peatland grant scheme was a perfect example. I, I agree um, with some of what Mike Rumble says, but I have to say that, you know, to ask for more talking shops, how many more talking shops do we need? No, I'm no sorry, time, I'm in Mr. my last Rumbles. minute. Now, when it comes to Peter Chapman, I, need, I agree with him we need to get on with a new system, but we need to have a vision. I would also agree with Claudia Beamish. You are right when you say that farmers aren't given credit. It's exactly the same as what Mark Ruskell has said. And I agree with Gillian Martin in which she says is that we need a plan for the future. Now, presiding officer, there are one or two other points that I agree with, but I would absolutely have to disagree with what Maureen Watt said. I am sorry. There are no bears hiding behind the trees. There are no power grabs by Westminster. So in conclusion, presiding officer, we welcome a Scottish agricultural bill. Let's get on with it. We also don't see that there's any problems with being in the UK agricultural bill. We welcome your signpost U-turn on Alphas. Let's close, work please. to get on with that. We, need more con we don't need more consultation. It's time to get moving for agriculture. And if you can't do that, Cabinet Secretary, I suggest you move on. Can I just say before I call the Cabinet Secretary, I've noticed a tendency this afternoon to be speaking directly to other members. All remarks should be directed through the Chair. I call the Cabinet Secretary uh, to close the debate. Uh, less than seven minutes, uh, sorry, less than eight minutes would be appreciated up to decision time, please. Uh, well, possessed of a, of a, a thick skin, I, I have enjoyed this uh, debate, uh, presenting officer, most of it, and we've had many, many thoughtful and informed contributions from across the chamber, uh, and I'd like just to respond to some of them. Um, starting with Donald Cameron, um, yes, the NFUS wanted clarity in re relation to what we were going to do on an agriculture bill, my announcement today gives that clarity. Uh, and that has followed the proper procedure of taking through Cabinet permission for a Scottish agriculture bill and spelling out in full technical detail why that is required and that has been agreed. Now, Mr Cameron says that he's in favour of a bespoke policy for Scotland. I, I welcome that. But he doesn't appear to want this parliament to be able to legislate for it. Obviously, I disagree with him there. I do agree with him also that food production should be at the heart of our policy, but would respectfully suggest that perhaps he should point that out to Michael Gove. Responding to Rhoda Grant, I'm grateful for her support for fair funding and for having a Scottish bill, and I, I'm grateful for the green support for that as well, which Mark Ruskell mentioned. Um, I also agree with her that all lost funding should be replaced, and she was one of many speakers who referred to the importance of funds such as leader and forestry, uh, rural priorities, aches. These all serve different but very important functions, many of them to provide good environmental stewardship, and it's essential that we have them all replaced. So far, the assurances that Mr Gove has provided relate primarily to Pillar 1 and farm support under Pillar 2, but they don't relate to leader forestry and other areas. That's troubling, particularly because almost all of these Pillar 2 programs take several years to organize, some of them with multi-landowners, and therefore the lack of confirmation that funding will be available uh, in relatively short order, in fact beyond 220 in some cases, is not only worrying, but is impairing investment and holding us back from doing good work in the environment, the likes of which Mr. Ruskell, Claudia Beamish, Rhoda Grant, Gail Ross, and others all quite correctly mentioned. On the Good Food Nation, a consultation exercise is taking place right now. It's right that we consult people, and I hope that members respond to that, and we will no doubt come back to it. I agree that we should support collaboration amongst farmers, which was recommended by the agricultural champion, uh, champions. And she highlighted that some CA payments are very large. So there's a cap, but it's, it's very high at the moment. In the, this paper, which I'm very proud to brandish once again, stability and simplicity, we set out a table 
which uh, indicated the types of returns in the event of putting a threshold, a maximum, a ceiling on the level of any individual recipient. So we should consider that as the agricultural champions recommended and using that funds for other purposes. Now, Mark Ruskell um, pointed out, and I think Mr Finney did as well, that the NFU president has supported the Scottish Government approach. I can assure Mr Ruskell that there is more than one official working in this. My colleague, Ms Cunningham, has just arrived, of course, will continue to engage with Mr Ruskell and others on those um, matters. Um, presiding officer, I have less time than I, than I normally have, so I apologise to various other members who made uh, contributions to the debate. Mr Scott, for example, I thought an interesting contribution apart from the uncharacteristic political remarks, but there we are, so what? Uh, but the remarks in relation to farming, I almost always agree with, with him, and I'm, I'm sure we can work, uh, work together. Um, I want to keep to last Mr Rumble's contribution, uh, and I think uh, perhaps I'm not the only person who felt there was a slight difference in tone in this contribution from Mr. Rumbles from some of his previous efforts. I have to say that Mr. Rumbles, the new Mike Rumbles, is very welcome. Yeah. <laughs> that his, in, his 100% constructive contribution to today's debate was as welcome as it was somewhat surprising to all of us. But, uh, but sincerely, I think he made the point, and Gillian Martin made this point as well, that people out there in Scotland do want to see us talk about the real issues, about farming, and without doing so in a way that is constantly bickering and backbiting. They do want that. To be fair to Mr. Rumbles, he did that today. Good luck to him, and I, I think that's a very good sign for 2019 and a lesson for us all, perhaps, to, to follow. I'll just finish with, with one reflection that we have provided, presiding officer, in our document, Stability and Simplicity, uh, a set of proposals which will take us forward for Brexit. We don't support Brexit, but as a responsible government, we have to prepare for the worst and every option, and we're doing that. And this document is the only document in the UK that set out a series of plans for five years till 2024. Now, I fully appreciate that some members are impatient to hear what policies we might be implementing in 2029. But I think, to be fair to ourselves, and indeed the respondees, more important to our consultation document, the farmers and crofters throughout the country, who have welcomed it, who have welcomed the certainty and stability of our proposals of continuing to provide financial support to them in these most uncertain times. It does take chutzpah to a new level into brazen effrontery to criticize us for not going beyond five years and 2024 when the Conservative government can't tell us what's going to happen next Tuesday. <laughs> so I have departed slightly from the consensual tone there at the end, but I hope everyone enjoyed it. <laughs>
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 15279.2 in the name of Rhoda Grant is yes, 51, no, 65. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is the Amendment 15279.1 in the name of Mark Ruskell, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Fergus Ewing, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment Number 15279.1 in the name of Mark Ruskell is yes, 24, no, 92. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the final question is that Motion 15279 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended, well, not as amended, as unamended, on future rural policy and support in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 15279 in the name of Fergus Ewing is yes, 83, no, 27. There were six abstentions and the motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>